So today, we continue our class uh, by going on to Sigmund Freud, the um, father of psychoanalysis, the um, neurologist turned uh, therapist, uh, turned social commentator, who was uh, writing uh, mostly in Vienna uh, at the end of the 19th century. His great work, The Interpretation of Dreams, comes out in 1900. Uh, and um, the work we're reading uh, for today uh, civilization and its discontents after World War I. Uh, Freud dies just on the eve of World War II, and so his lifetime, he's born in 1856, spans a crucial period in the transformation of European intellectual history and uh, European politics and culture. Uh, he's working in Vienna, uh, and uh, Vienna is uh, a hothouse of cultural activities uh, at the end of the 19th century. Fan de Siecle Vienna, as it's called, uh, is a place where you have a, a concatenation of, of, of uh, different cultural forms uh, that in, in Western Europe exist over a long period of time. They're smushed together in Vienna at the end of the 19th century. So you have uh, the Romantics from the middle of the 19th century and the Realists for later on in the century. You have the the, um, the reaction against realism uh, by the kind of populist um, uh, right-wing people, all the, you have the communists and the anarchists, all of these people um, uh, uh, are flocking to Vienna, making it a, uh, this, this crucible of cultural f uh, intensity of, 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 of uh, ferment, uh, and, uh, and it is a place of enormous interest. Uh, and a place uh, uh, that uh, cultural historians have had uh, a wonderful time trying to understand as a, as a symptom, really, of, of modernity. Uh, Vienna becomes a kind of emblem for um, the modern world. Uh, and part of that is uh, that at the, in Vienna, in the, at the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century, in Vienna you have... Uh, a, a turn away from politics at the uh, surface level, of the street level, of the, uh, of the public sphere, and you turn a turn towards the psychological, a turn towards the depths, as, as uh, Sigmund Freud sometimes uh, talked about it. Uh, the great historian of this uh, period in, in, is, in, uh, is Karl Shorsky, who was a um, uh, my teacher, I should say, and, uh, both as an undergraduate and a, a graduate student, Karl Shorsky's book, uh, Fan de Siecle, Vienna Politics and Culture, laid out uh, a paradigm for understanding um, this turn away from the public, a turn away from the historical, and towards the psychological, towards the instinctual or the elemental in music and poetry and in, in, in politics and in, in psychoanalysis. Today we're going to focus on Freud, um, and we're going to focus uh, on civilization and its discontents, but Freud is one of those figures that most of you, uh, or many of you, uh, will have heard a lot about. I mean, Sigmund Freud is a kind of pop culture figure and not just a, 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 a person of the interest in the history of science or intellectual history. He's a, he's a figure that uh, appears in movies and TV shows and uh, his influence is, is, is felt not only in medicine and, uh, uh, and in debates around uh, psychiatry, but his influence is felt across the cultural spectrum. And a, a lot of the, the, what I'll be talking to you about today, a lot of that comes from an exhibition I curated at the Library of Congress uh, in the 1990s. And uh, you can see lots of information about Freud and uh, uh, examples of his, uh, his notebooks and his, his correspondence, as well as some really fun and interesting film clips uh, at uh, a Library of Congress exhibition site. And, and uh, we'll put the link here for you to see uh, uh, so you can, you can, you can check out uh, some of Freud's key ideas as they get translated into popular culture. So well, the first thing that comes into your head when I say the word Freud is what? Mother, Mother sex. Sorry? Mother. Mother sex. We're done. <laughs> Mother sex. Anything else? Very uninhibited here in the front row. It's typical. People sitting in the back row have the most repression. Right? So, psychoanalysis, very good, tame thing. 
So, uh, what other things come to your mind? Killing your father. Killing your father. This is a healthy class. When I was a student, uh, we did this exercise with the renowned Professor Henry Abeloff, um, and uh, we went on for, I don't know, 12 minutes, and he kept saying, there's another thing you should say, and everybody was like, oh, uh, you know, sex, mother, mother, sex, not sex, mother, um, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. And then he finally said the hardest thing to, for anyone to remember, according to the story, um, is uh, the, the, the desire to kill your father. What did I just do there? Repressed. Repressed, right? I had a almost Freudian slip. Instead of saying the desire to kill your father, I almost said, I'm not going to tell you. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's repressed. But so what are we doing now? What, we're doing free association. Free association. Why do why, why, why is free association important in for Freud? This is kind of background civilization's discontents, in case you just tuned in. <coughs> why, why is free association important for Freud? Yeah. It helps you overcome repression. The idea is, the idea is that uh, if I can get you somehow to loosen up to say what comes into your mind before your conscience kicks in, your superego, for it sometimes calls it, right? Uh, that before the forces of oppression kick in, um, you might say something you don't expect to say. And of course, you won't do it in the beginning, according to Freud. Uh, but eventually, if you get into the habit, uh, you, you, you will loosen up the inhibitions so that the desires come out more clearly. Freud was very interested in um, the role of sexuality in f the formation of human consciousness. Uh, he, he, he focused on this early on in his career because he felt that the stories he kept hearing from his patients invariably came back to questions of desire, questions of desire. And, and uh, you know, early in his career, Freud didn't do what I just did, close your eyes, tell me the first thing that pops into your mind. What do we call that? We call that free association, right? We call that free association. That is when the psychoanalyst says, okay, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? And you, you, as you say something quickly before you have a chance to censor yourself, right? That's what free association is supposed to be. Before you have a chance to censor yourself, you say what pops into your mind. Now, before Freud came to that idea of free association, uh, he, he um, was a hyp hypnotist. Freud uh, was very interested in getting beyond the censorship, getting beyond the con conscious control of the, of the mind by hypnotizing patients to find out what really was plaguing them. And so he would do the same, you know, with the watch, back and forth, back and forth, and you were getting sleepy, you were getting sleepy. And, and he learned this technique from the great French neurologist uh, Jean uh, Martin Charcot, who was working in Paris in the end of the 19th century. And Freud went to um, sh uh, study with Charcot. Um, he had a, was already interested in hypnosis. He went to study with Charcot and, and was very impressed by Charcot's uh, ability to take a person who, who seemed um, uh, just completely contorted by pain and spasm and, and unconscious uh, or automatic uh, uh, bodily movements and under hypnosis find out um, uh, uh, how, what had happened uh, to this person and, and give them this, some suggestions about uh, how to uh, change. Now Freud was not a good hypnotist, and that's in some ways some of the reasons why he he moved away from this this uh, mode of getting past censorship, getting past our uh, unwillingness to face what we really uh, desire, as he comes to think of it. That is, uh, Freud was working with a patient uh, he calls Emmy von N. Uh, we uh, know her now as uh, Fanny Moser. She was a very wealthy woman. Uh, who had plenty of uh, physicians, and she could use the uh, different physicians. And Freud was, he was hypnotizing her, and he'd be saying something like, you're getting sleepy. And she would, she did, no, I'm not getting sleepy. And she, said, yeah. and she would you know, think, you're not a very good doctor, or, you know, you're not helping me. And Freud was frustrated. He, he needed this patient, actually. He needed the money. He was not a rich man. He, he had been engaged, engaged for a long, long time because he couldn't put together the money he thought necessary to start an independent household. So he's frustrated with his inability to really get this patient um, uh, to, 
to fall into the hypnotic trance so she would be able to both uh, uh, talk about uh, who she was and what she remembered and also receive suggestions from the doctor. He was frustrated about that. And then at some point, Emmy Fanan, Fanny Moser, the, her real name, says to Freud, listen, okay, you can hypnotize me. You can hypnotize me. But first, before you hypnotize me, let me tell you my story. This is a big moment for Freud. She says, let me tell you my story. And then Freud says, I fell in with her stories. This is when Freud becomes a Freudian, if I can put it that way. Freud becomes a Freudian when he says, I don't hypnotize so I can tell people what to do to give them a suggestion, like a medication we would give today. Freud says, I fell in with her stories because I needed to understand what she had to say and to interpret what she had to say, to help her interpret the meaning of what she was telling me. This is the beginning of modern, what we call today, the psychodynamic therapy. It's the beginning of Freudianism. It's the beginning of, of a psychoanalysis. Uh, and so in the 1890s, Freud is doing this. And all the stories he listens to, all the stories he listens to, come back to questions of desire. He says questions of sex. He knows that people don't want to hear that word sex, and so he likes to say it. He thinks it's, he's, 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 uh, he's making people confront their hypocritical morality. So it always comes back to questions of sex. And what was really offensive in what he had to say is that Freud, Freud insisted it comes back to questions of sex in the family. In the family. And so he finds that children, uh, uh, as they are remembered as adults, that our childhood memories, our childhood memories are memories of, uh, of uh, sexuality or sex gone awry. And for a long time in the 1890s, he actually believes that uh, parents are most of the time sexually abusing their children. And that the, 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 the neurotics or the sick people that he sees are people who's been, who have been abused by their parents um, and um, uh, that abuse has resulted in, a, in, a, in psychopathology, in, in some kind of mental illness. By the end of the 1890s, Freud changes his mind about this. Instead of thinking people have been abused, he starts to think, in fact, what people are remembering is their desire that they can't act on. 